Thank you very much, all of you, for uh, coming along here this morning. It's a bit of bitter, bitter morning, so I uh, really appreciate you coming up to uh, hear about equality and uh, a bit about our story um, from the, the gang at Carmicola. Equality is uh, an appropriate theme for us because it's, it's how we started and it's why we started and it's the thing that gives us our purpose and why we get out of bed and turn up to work in the morning. And so equality has been uh, part of our journey um, since we first uh, heard about uh, the plight of kola nut farmers in West Africa. Uh, and we, uh, first of all, uh, felt that uh, the world does not need another kola. Uh, yesterday, uh, the world's biggest kola brand sold 1.9 billion drinks. And today they're going to do the same. But not one of those drinks actually contains kola nut. So uh, we, we, we found this uh, a surprising fact when we learned about it uh, back in about 2011, 2012, and we were researching uh, growers in West Africa for other products that we were looking at. And uh, there's two big numbers up there. And I wonder if you could, anybody here could give a punt as to what the bigger, biggest number up there is all about. So that is the uh, brand value of Coca-Cola at the moment, according to Interbrand, uh, in US dollars. So they've done pretty well out of cola. The lower number is the GDP of Sierra Leone. Uh, six million people live in Sierra Leone. It's a beautiful country, a country that produces cola nut. Uh, but that is, uh, at the moment, they're uh, languishing uh, at the bottom of the UN's development index. So this was the inequity we heard about and learned about uh, when we were um, trying to make a banana business work. And uh, we, we thought it interesting, but we didn't put uh, any more thought into it other than that. Because one thing we were quite convinced of is that the world doesn't need another cola drink. But a friend of ours in, uh, in London who had... Uh, had left uh, Sierra Leone as a, as really as a refugee, uh, thought more about it, and he uh, he went to some kola nut growers uh, in the border of Sierra Leone and Liberia, and encouraged them to send us some kola nut. So we got a DHL envelope uh, in Auckland in about early 2012 of uh, about a, two kilos of kola nut. And I'm not sure if you've ever come across kola nut before, although I know Joe will have, but uh, these are the kola nuts. You can pass them around. They're a bit long in the tooth. These are from our original shipment. They don't look like that when they're fresh. So we got these p bright pink and white rubbery kola nuts in this DHL envelope and then spent the next six months uh, playing with them. And all the time thinking, you know, this is a fun little thing to do, but we're not going to do another cola drink. He or he who brings cola brings life, or she who brings cola brings life, is a saying from the Mende people in Sierra Leone and Niger and Nigeria and Liberia and that part of West Africa. And it's a hugely spiritual part of their life. The kola nut is uh, something that parents will chew on to give them the inspiration to name their newborn children. Uh, it's something that uh, a dowry is paid in kola nut, uh, that business deals are sealed by the splitting of the kola nut, and friends greet each other by passing kola nut between themselves. So it was a very important part of the people of uh, Sierra Leone, and when we got to know them, we realized that it, it was uh, that the injustice of what had happened in the 1880s when uh, Dr. Pemberton had taken this Coca-Cola recipe and out of this cola nut and then uh, given it to Coca-Cola eventually, who then synthesized it into some nasty chemicals that they keep a secret. Uh, that injustice and that inequity sort of grated on us. So when we 
eventually came up with a cola drink that we enjoyed drinking ourselves. We started giving it to a couple of cafes locally and it <coughs> took off from there. Here's the cola nut and it's, when, as it comes from the tree. It grows in pods about 10 metres above the forest floor, between 10 and 20 metres above the forest floor in the rainforest and on the border of Liberia and Sierra Leone and, and many other parts of West Africa. So every bottle of Kama Cola contributes to the people who grow our cola nut. Selling an organic real cola is our way of giving back to the people who originally started the cola industry. This is our purpose and that's why we call ourselves Karma Cola. When you go to uh, Sierra Leone, you'll be greeted with cola nut and uh, instead of being offered tea or coffee. And, and if you're not, you better watch out. It's an intriguing place and it's a beautiful place to visit. So we spent time with the village that had originally sent us this cola nut and we returned there with some, some of our karma cola to show them where it had got to. They tried it. Uh, and they were slightly bemused. They are not used to a highly sugary drink, and they had never tasted uh, a cola drink at that point, um, which is surprising because uh, in the rest of Africa you'll find Coca-Cola within about two meters of any, any uh, building, it seems. But what we realized that trading cola nut with the, the people of these villages was not sufficient, and was not going to you know, redress the imbalance that had been created as we saw with those two big numbers. That we needed to go way beyond that and, and way beyond fair trade, way beyond just simply being organic. So we really need to have a much richer relationship with them because they've not had it easy in that part of Sierra Leone. They had just come through a 10 year war and their crops had been devastated. They had hidden away for 10 years in other countries. So the communities there that we work with uh, had spent 10 years scattered across West Africa, in Benin, in Nigeria, hiding away from Sierra Leone and Liberia. It had split up all their families. Many of their, f of their families didn't return or never returned. And their crops had been devastated. Their way of life had been devastated. And it was an opportunity for us to get involved and try and give them the opportunity uh, and redress that balance. And, and it's been an amazing, an amazing learning curve for us. Uh, they have taught us a lot more than we've ever had the chance to give back to them yet. So we felt that you know, a cola drink that actually connect is, connects the growers with uh, the consumer was, was something that was missing from the world. We've seen it done so well by the speciality coffee industry. We've seen it done by trade aid. Uh, we know that it can be done and those stories can be told and they can be really compelling. So three of us kicked it off. It's a much bigger and much more capable team now, I can tell you, but uh, Simon in the middle there is the, uh, is the ideas person. He's the person that should be here today talking to you creatives because he's the one that comes up with the designs, comes up with the ideas, and is, leads on the storytelling. Chris on the, on the right there, my brother does the logistics and operations and I do the boring backroom stuff. <laughs> so it's really, we're united throughout Karma Cola and all good in, in that central bit is, is our purpose and everything uh, leads to that. The Karma Cola Foundation sits in the middle, it's a separate entity which uh, has power over our business. So under our constitution, Karma Cola Foundation actually can call the shots on ingredients and the business side of the business isn't allowed to uh, re reject their uh, opinion or they, they can stop us putting a product to the market because they're not convinced about uh, 
the, uh, the provenance of any ingredients. And uh, we've, we've done it that way purposefully so that, um, you know, five, 10 years, 20 years down the track, that um, the, the purpose <coughs> that we've tried to set up can't be undone by other people that may get involved or new investors or that sort of thing. Weirdly, uh, it all started with bananas. In 2010, Simon, Chris and I were sort of uh, mucking around on a piha beach and uh, wondering what we would do next with our lives. And we tried to bring in bananas from Samoa, fresh bananas. We had this idea that tropical fruit um, shouldn't have to come from halfway around the world when we've got these extraordinary gardens in Tonga and Samoa and Fiji and Papua New Guinea uh, and Melanesia and in the Solomons, and, and that that's where we should, you know, our tropical farms for New Zealand and Australia should be there. Why should they, you know, come from South America? And that's where originally uh, those countries had, had made most of their income. So we tried to import bananas from Samoa, and it, was, um, it, it wasn't successful. The bananas couldn't handle the fumigation from MPI, and uh, we had a banana gate incident in West Auckland where uh, a, a, a small part of um, Titarangi had to be evacuated uh, thanks to uh, a banana dump that drove a lot of wasps and rats into the area over a, about a month, um, thanks to my uh, decision to be cheap and avoid the dumping charges of dumping uh, five tonnes of bananas. Uh, at that point, no one gave us really much of a chance of selling the same bunch of bananas, the bunches that Elise kindly used this morning for your breakfast, uh, for a dollar more. You know, the people said, you know, bananas are two ninety nine or one ninety nine. You try to sell them for three ninety nine, then uh, people are just going to walk away. But we persisted. We we put a container on the water and decided that we would find a way to tell a story and. Uh, and get, the, get these 20,000 bunches of bananas that come in these containers out to market within seven days before they go off. So the pressure was certainly on. And uh, we managed to sell about half of that container at the full price, and that was enough to give us the confidence to get the next container on the water. But it was a tough going, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't advise anybody going to the fresh fruit industry too soon. But uh, we, we've, we've continued to do it. It's been a great uh, relationship with growers in southwest Ecuador, and we've really enjoyed getting to know them. Uh, Daniel, one of our team members, is there now. We have uh, pretty much uh, one of our team on the ground there at any point, um, and working with the growers and understanding their lives. Uh, and ironically, again, it was the uh, banana growers who actually set up our business. They knew the logistics better than us, they uh, have got so sophisticated that they are trading foreign exchange. They are, uh, they are negotiating with shipping companies, and they were doing all the things for us from um, shacks in southwest Ecuador that we didn't have the sophistication or the knowledge to do, just to get our business off the ground. So we have, have, have felt that we just need to keep that going. <clears throat> in the time we... we uh, We've sold over 10 million bunches now to an amazing group of New Zealand consumers and we've had massive support from Common Sense Organics and More Wilsons, from Thorndon New World and from uh, Huckleberry Farms in Auckland and, and, and a whole group of New Worlds and Pack and Saves across the country. Uh, and in that time we've been able to return 1.2 million in funding to schools, to medical clinics, to a special needs school in Ecuador. And uh, you know we're putting about 2,000 children through school each year. It's um, and and that is that is just business. You know, if if you um, that is how business should be done with people, even if they produce our fruit or our spices from halfway around the world. Um, if we do business here, we expect to be able to put our kids through school. We expect to get medical care. Um, so. We're doing nothing more than what a regular business should be doing. And you know, that's how we see it. You, know, you need to treat the people who grow your fruit 
from halfway around the world as if they're doing it from next door. And it's the way that we've always thought about uh, our businesses. You know, Wilson here, who has been here to uh, Wellington, mainly because we, we want to make the connection two ways. You know, it's often uh, business people from New Zealand or Australia starting an ethical firm will spend a lot of time in market, uh, in, in origin, working with their growers. But uh, we want to make it two ways. So the growers come out here and see their work as well and see their, see their uh, fruit on the shelves. You know, they spend time in Moore Wilson's talking to the staff there. They spend time talking to consumers. They meet the common sense staff. They spend time in store. And Wilson and his daughter Kelly, who happens to be the first person in that part of uh, southwest Ecuador to ever go to university, um, have, have spent time in Wellington. And, and it's just a great part of the storytelling. It gives us more content, more material to get out to our followers. So how did we make uh, a business, uh, you know, how, how are we trying to make a start, a start to a cola business that has to take on uh, a company that has four billion annual advertising budget? Well, the first step is, is, is all with Simon, and it's to make, it, make us look good on the shelf. The quality of our product and our purpose is all we have to convince people to buy our, our drinks and to make our cola famous. So the first thing we do is to try and get their attention on the shelf. On the uh, bottle here, this is Mummy Water, and she was, uh, she was uh, put together by an, a PR artist, Beck Wheeler. So Beck, um, we taught, we, we uh, we told Beck all about our stories in Sierra Leone. Now, Mummy Water is a water goddess that lives in the Moa River that runs through the communities that produce uh, kola nut. She's sometimes good, she's sometimes bad. She uh, can decide whether their crops are going to fail or whether they're going to uh, provide for the, the villagers for that year. And she's a huge part of their spiritual life. So we felt that that was kind of quite a neat part of the story. You know, in every bottle of ours is a treat. You know, there's good and bad in every bottle. It does good, but it is a treat and it does contain sugar. So we wanted to reflect the fact that uh, there's good and bad in every bottle. And Mummy Water also takes us and the consumer back to Africa. You know, it's trying to communicate our story and why we exist on the bottle in a way that means that we don't have to be in... Uh, Copenhagen in a cafe and try to tell our story because we just don't have the budget to do that. So we use this, this us, we try to do our storytelling in our pictures and in our devices and our logos so we don't have to do it. And you know, we want to look great so people pick us off the shelves uh, even if they've never heard of Karma Cola. And, and Gingerella and Lemmy have followed on those themes, is that we feel that the bottles themselves have to look beautiful. Uh, and, you know, to, to most part, we seem to have, have got onto something there. Next, you know, we've got to taste great. You picked off the shelf, you know, you want to be, make sure that you're going to make a fantastic experience um, when people you drink your drinks. So we make sure our supply chain lives our values completely wherever we get our ingredients. And we just use real ingredients. We went back to the original recipe of the 1880s, looked at it and decided how we could get real ingredients to reflect those, uh, th those herbs and spices that were originally used by Dr. Pemberton and have never been used. And things taste a whole lot of better when they're not filled with E numbers or high fructose corn syrup or a whole lot of things you can't pronounce. So, you know, we've, we've got lime oil and orange oil, we've got coriander, nutmeg, barley, and cinnamon and vanilla all in our drinks, and this is how we get it. You know, the, this is the vanilla that we get from Sri Lanka, and we uh, turn it into, into the syrup that makes our drinks uh, that we produce now 
in three parts of the world, in Austria, Somerset, and in Tauranga. And of course, sugar cane from India. And by having that purpose and, and the story, we've been able to get others to tell it for us. Earned Media has been very good to us uh, throughout the world. Earned Media has driven awareness in, in a way that we could never possibly do without that purpose or without that story. Uh, we, you know, we, we had a bit of luck and soon after we uh, put our cola into a few cafes in London, the Guardian did a taste test of all the craft colas in the UK and we came out on top and that was a, a huge boost to us. But beyond that, we've had BBC and Bloomberg uh, do, do uh, TV work on us and we've you know, been very, very fortunate that Earn Media has been able to tell our story. But beyond that, we've also you know, gone back to old media. Uh, you know, we're trying to zig when others zag. And while everybody's fighting for digital real estate at the moment, we put our story into a zine. We've, we, continue to do, we continue to plan to do zines when we can fit them in. And the zine has been a way that we can get our story into the people in cafes right throughout the world uh, who have our drinks, even though we've never had a chance to visit them. <coughs> but it does come back to doing good and having that story and having that purpose. And authenticity is, uh, is vital. So we, we have to be able to, uh, to show that what we do is genuine and we didn't simply make it up simply for, for a purpose or for just to throw it into a zine. This is a bit out of date, but we uh, have uh, five teachers now we're fully employing in Sierra Leone who teach, teach just over 200 kids. Furthermore, we have about 80 scholarships for girls in that part of uh, Sierra Leone. Built a vehicle bridge and we're doing a whole lot of other work on the ground there with HIV awareness, with Ebola sensitization training, with literacy training for adults, uh, and with trade entrepreneurs, uh, all of which is led by the communities themselves. So we have put the ideas for none of those projects in their minds. The community leaders and the families come together and they decide how they would like the foundation's money spent. And they have initiated all of these projects. We've simply enabled some of the funding to make it happen and also put people on the ground in Sierra Leone to support them, those projects coming together. So it's very much, it's vital that uh, as a small um, entrepreneurial company in, in New Zealand, we don't think that we know how the people in, south, in southern Sierra Leone should change their lives. Uh, that, uh, I'm sure, has been uh, part of a legacy of huge issues in Africa and elsewhere. So we're very mindful that it needs to be community-led and very carefully done by people who know a lot more about <coughs> development work than we do. Ed education for women in Africa is rare, and it's very rare in Sierra Leone and Liberia, where our communities are. It's really tough. Um, and we, uh, as three guys, all with daughters, we found that uh, quite qu confronting, that in inequity of opportunity. Uh, so that has been one of our focuses, uh, and somewhere we, we know the outcomes will, will be positive if we can get uh, more, more girls into school at primary and secondary. And that will continue to be one of our major focuses of the foundation. Here's one of the HIV awareness troops. They're, uh, they're basically actors and actresses who get out there and tell the story amongst the communities. And they do a whole lot more than just HIV awareness, but in terms of uh, adult literacy classes and a whole lot of things, they get out there and just have a whole heap of fun, dance, make great music, uh, and uh, the, uh, a little goes a long way. Uh, and it, you know, it, our, our support of their group is very modest, but 
it, it enables them to cover a lot of ground and get in front of a lot of people and tell their story. But it, equality also comes back here home in how we look after our people and make sure that we attract amazing people to Carmicola, and we've certainly been able to do that. You know, one of the things that we've always done is that we know we need people that are much brighter, smarter, and quicker, and more creative than us. And we've been able to do that. When we've got a purpose, and when, you've, when you're going somewhere and you can tell the people where our, what our vision is and what we're about, then we've been very lucky in London and Auckland and Wellington here to be able to attract amazing team members. Uh, you know, living wage employer, uh, things like ESOP, employee share ownership programs for everybody to make sure that they're part of the journey. They can enjoy the roller coaster and see where we're going. And all of those sort of things have just um, make good business sense. They're not about giving anything away. They're just, uh, that sort of empowerment just is just good business. So we've taken our little drinks and we've made a start. Uh, we've been going for about four and a half years and we, uh, we have started to uh, nibble at the heels of that big, uh, that big brand out there that we feel needs, needs, we need to redress the balance. And uh, you will, uh, you know, we've, we've been able to win awards. Design awards have really helped us whether it's been the best awards here or uh, the World Taste Awards, which we've won in the UK, the World's Fairest Trader, uh, the World Beverage Innovation Awards. Um, all of those have helped us be able to tell our story, given us some media, given us uh, some, some kudos so we can get in front of uh, distributors and, and give them the opportunity to sell our product. And you know about the uh, the sugar debate. Obviously, it's something that is very much on our minds, and it was where we started, and it was the thing that uh, gave us a, a bit of concern. You know that we don't think the world needs another cola drink, but we are pretty convinced it needs a better one, uh, and we would love you to substitute, um, and and everybody is to substitute their uh, their corporate chemical colas for a, a one that's made out of real stuff. And this is our new uh, natural, no artificial sweetener, uh, zero sugar cola, which is launching in the UK this month and will be here in, the UK, in New Zealand um, by September, uh, provided our production gets together. That's a bit of the story where we've got to. We're halfway up those dotted lines at the end, and this year is uh, ahead, of, ahead of forecast, which is great. Um, mainly thanks to the United Kingdom, which has now taken over from New Zealand and is uh, forging ahead at, uh, at a rate we can barely keep up with. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. We've never done an international trade show. We've never actually pitched to a distributor who hasn't come to us. We went to the United Kingdom by mistake because Simon was at the London Coffee Festival and got a bit carried away. And uh, largely that is uh, how we've got around the world so far. Um, and we're in about 21 countries at the moment um, after four and a half years and it's, uh, it's been a little bit um, nuts and at times um, our um, suff long suffering uh, board members have, um, have been pretty convinced that uh, no one knows what is going on in Carmicola <laughs> and um, uh, in some of these places, we've found, about, found out that they're selling our product um, a couple of months after they've started selling it. Uh, so um, we haven't always been in control, and we don't intend to stay completely in control because it is the thing that keeps us going and keeps us on, our, on, on the edge. So, and uh, we've, we've now sold uh, over 10 million bottles or cans of uh, Karma Cola. So, it, it, uh, although it started small here in Wellington and Auckland, it's, um, it's, it's gaining, a bit of, uh, gaining a bit of strength and we, uh, you know, we're really excited about where we're going to go. 
um, but it's that purpose that keeps on sustaining us and it's the thing that we always come back to. Um, it's, uh, the foundation is the centre of everything we do uh, and, and as I said, it's the people of Sierra Leone who, who are driving us to, to sell more and it's the people in, in our villages who, which we've also extended into support into Sri Lanka and into India, Papua New Guinea, we're now looking at Fiji and doing projects there that uh, to support the growers who are actually doing all the hard work. Uh, we just get to do uh, the much more straightforward task of getting bottles on shelves and cans on shelves in different parts of the world. Uh, in order to try and address some of that imbalance that we as, as uh, crass commercialization has, has, has achieved over the last 100 years and try to undo some of that damage and redress the balance. And when it comes down to it, even if you were some sort of cynical capitalist, you know, hedge fund manager in New York and you wanted to start a beverage company, then, you know, you would do it this way if you really thought about it and you understood uh, the supply chain, you understood what consumers were looking for because in the end, uh, we don't have the advertising budgets of the big guys. And if you're going to start a business, you need to start with purpose and with a story to tell. And it means that you can take on the big guys and, um, and, and you can make that change. So, uh, you know, if you take away anything today, it's that um, being good is good for business. And, uh, you know, our business hopefully one day will be healthy and we will be able, but that will be only on the back of the fact that we've got authenticity and a great purpose at our heart. So thank you very much for hearing me out on that. Thank you. We have one minute before nine o'clock, but I imagine there are some questions. So let's do questions. Who's got questions? Yes. Um, how have you found doing business, logistically doing business across multiple time zones, across more, you know, the suppliers all around the world, growers, you've got your own tight, tight deadlines, I'm sure they do too, how have you found that? Finding great people who've, who are really adaptable and learn quickly. Um, we went through the banana lessons, and bananas are super tough, they're perishable, they, they're, uh, you've got about two to three days shelf life and they're worthless after that. So that was sort of uh, how we learnt our way and drinks have been slightly more straightforward than that. Um, we, we haven't had us out of stock yet, but yeah, uh, finding great people and also being in market. So uh, we've got a team of about 12 now, We're starting a creative hub in London. Um, so our creative uh, is done very close to market. So understanding the market and having an operations team there is, is vital. And then, yeah, a lot of late night phone calls and Skypes. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Um, how, what are your long term plans for trying to increase your brand awareness? Um, from my perspective, I haven't, sorry, I haven't heard of Carl and Cola, so it's really nice to come to this and hear all about it. I work for an organisation as well, based with a big water, but it's very small, and we have the same thing, we haven't heard of you. So it's, yeah, it's nice. Yeah, to it's one of those challenges, you know, we've, up till sort of last year, we've actually been within one to two degrees of people who buy our drinks. So we've, we've been in the cafes, we go there, we know we've got a sales team on the ground. So we've always been within one to two degrees. We've been able to talk to baristas, get our story told within sight of where our products are being sold. But now we're further afield. It's the real challenge that, our, um, that Simon has in terms of being able to broadcast that story. You know, digital media is, is going to be super important to us. Um, you know, finding people who can really do the, the analytics and work out how to do that storytelling. Um, earned media will continue to be part of, our, part of the mix, getting other, you know, finding ways that um, regular media will tell our story in and, and new places. And, because that we've got that purpose is that we are finding that uh, you know journalists are really keen to to talk about Karma Cola and and other, you know similar businesses and tell that story for us, um, and then taking people to origin. So 
you know, we, we, we take, we're going to be taking journalists to Sierra Leone to tell the story of the kola nut and the growers and, and broadcast that to the world. And that's, you know, that's an opportunity we've got that not all businesses have. Um, yeah, so getting journalists on the ground and inviting them to Sierra Leone to say, hey, you know where kola nut comes from? Um, yeah, that will be one of, one of the things. But yeah, it is, it's a constant challenge. It, you know, the content marketing is going to be vital as well. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah, we 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 do have we have a range of drinks that are that are the low sugar drinks that are come with organic fruit from New Zealand and other parts of the world, and there are little uh, there's sort of a light bulb bottle um, uh, our sodas, but with um, gingerella uh, is uh, working with growers in Sri Lanka. So the ginger comes from Sri Lanka, and we work with a group of women growers in the highlands in Sri, Sri Lanka who produce. Uh, ginger and um, likewise um, we we have vanilla growers as well and the sugar in the drinks is produced with a cooperative in India so we we haven't always just focused on New Zealand supply we want to be global and uh, we also want to address the equity inequity of, of third world producers who haven't had the chance to to, to get all the basic uh, Returns from a day's work that you would expect, and able to, and you know, in their inability to be able to send their kids to school or get basic medical care. So that's one of the conscious things that we've done. That we have gone to the far reaches of the world to find some of our ingredients, and also because uh, you know, not, there's not a lot of organic ginger grown here in New Zealand. Yeah, or kola nut yet. <laughs> in, Yes. Um, I know you said that in Sierra Lake they don't really drink kola but in other parts of Africa they do. In that map that you showed of where kola kola was distributed, I noticed there wasn't really any um, African countries in there. No, we haven't we haven't sent much there. We have sent um, a couple of pallets to the president of Sierra Leone and to the British High Commissioner because they want to talk it up. Um, but there is you, you get a bottle of uh, Coca-Cola for about 20 cents in uh, most of Africa and uh, we simply couldn't even do it for barely 10 times that amount so that difference in price point um, you know, is, is not something that's going to make it terribly attractive to a lot of places um, in Africa yet but we would love to be there and, and also certainly in a couple of great cafes in Freetown and Sierra Leone we, we, we do intend to be there. Um, yeah. Do you think they will change the Yeah, I mean, we, we hope to, but at the same stage, we don't want to force a, another sugary drink on them if they're not, you know, if they're not into it either. So, yeah. It, it, yeah, I'm sure it will change over time. But, um, yeah, it's, at this stage, it hasn't been a focus for us. And also, the logistics are quite challenging in getting it back into, into Africa. Oh, well, we have some thank you things here for you. Oh, wow. Some of our wonderful sponsors. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very us. much. Cheers. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.